Hi, and welcome to The Horn, a podcast from International Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell. On this episode, we're talking about the U.S. sanctions on Sudan tied to its designation as a state sponsor of terror. At Crisis Group, we have long argued for these sanctions to be lifted, and it's even more urgent in the current political climate as the country begins its transition after decades of rule by Omar al-Bashir. To talk us through the politics in Washington, D.C., we have today's guest, Cameron Hudson. Cameron is currently at the Atlanta Council, previously a U.S. diplomat working on Sudan for the State Department. Hi, everyone. I'm doing some field research at the moment, so I'm recording just a quick update on my iPhone. So we recorded this episode on January 27th, so please keep that in mind, as there's been a number of major developments that have taken place since then, uh, some of which you can actually read about in a piece Cameron just wrote for Foreign Policy, and we'll post a link to that article in the show notes. Enjoy! Cameron, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks, Alan. So I'm going to ask what is, for me, the burning question, which is, will the U.S. lift the state sponsor of terror sanctions on Sudan this year? And if so, when? Um, Well, I didn't bring my crystal ball to this conversation, so uh, I'm going to have to give you my best guess, which is um, I think there's a good chance that that it could happen. Um, I think it's hard to say what the timeline uh, will be because there are a lot of uh, extenuating factors that are going to uh, play into this, not least of which is, you know, it's an election year in the United States. Um, and I think it's very difficult for Sudan or any other country right now to kind of um, muscle the, their way in for the attention that's going to be really required um, to lift this de- determination. It's not an easy, uh, it's not an easy thing to do either politically or procedurally. And so I think there's going to uh, need to be some deliberation involved. And right now, I just haven't seen the administration uh, particularly focused on this question. So I think it's going to be um, hard to get those. Uh, kind of stars to align. But on a practical side and on a substantive side, I think the Sudanese are doing uh, the things that they need to be doing on the uh, on the counterterrorism front to try to advance this issue as much as they can. So I think we'll dive into those on the U.S. side a bit later, but I think it'd be useful first to take quite a bit of a step back and talk about why. Why does the U.S. have sanctions on Sudan to begin with? Um, Well, the state sponsor of terrorism sanctions go back to the 90s when when Sudan was hosting Osama bin Laden primarily um, and was, in fact, a state sponsor of terrorism. There were terrorist acts, uh, not just that uh, al-Qaeda carried out, but that the Sudanese state themselves uh, carried out, uh, most famously an assassination attempt against Hosni Mubarak. And so, um, you know, when the designation was, was put on Sudan, they were really... Uh, you know, very deserving of it, frankly. Since that time, though, I think Sudan, and certainly since uh, the events of 9-11, uh, Sudan has been trying to, I think, rectify, uh, but frankly, move away from the kind of politics of uh, the National Islamic Front and Muslim Brotherhood. They moved away from that ideology, certainly in the past uh, 10, 15, 20 years, um, and have become, as the United States says, a very close and continuing partner in the fight against uh, terrorism. Uh, so when you look at the designation today, it really is a legacy issue. Um, now, I think the complicating factor is, of course, that uh, there are these legal judgments, um, families of victims of the uh, USS Cole attack and the embassy bombing attacks in uh, Tanzania and, and Kenya uh, brought lawsuits against the state of Sudan uh, for its support uh, to Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda as they planned those attacks against American interests. Um, And so it isn't just a legacy issue now. There are now, in fact, legal judgments in U.S. courts holding uh, the government of Sudan responsible for those crimes. And so there is some uh, remedy that uh, that needs to go through formal channels for this to be lifted. Would you say on the political front that this compensation for terrorist victims has now become the main obstacle, at least when it comes to the overall politics of lifting these sanctions? 
You know, it, it wasn't it wasn't such a big issue in the Obama administration because I don't think we got as close uh, to lifting the designation then. The political fortunes of Sudan have completely reversed themselves in the last uh, 12 months, and so there's this greater effort now uh, to do everything that we can to support democratic government or at least civilian rule inside of Sudan. And so this question has um, has really come to the fore. Um, I think that Prime Minister Hamdok has. Um, I think uh, taken a few missteps out of the gate in terms of pushing and lobbying for the designation to be lifted without fully understanding what it was going to take to lift it. And that has alarmed, I think, many of the families uh, in the coal and embassy bombing cases who I think all of a sudden got quite uh, startled by the fact that it looked like this was going to happen very quickly based upon what uh, the prime minister was saying. And so um, you saw a quick reaction from those uh, from those families who have uh, been waiting now for you know as many as uh, two decades uh, for some kind of justice to be served uh, for the, the crimes that were committed against their family members. And so um, I think what, what we saw was uh, this administration kind of hitting the brakes and saying, okay, we really need to rethink this and, re- and, and think through it very carefully uh, before we make any uh, sudden moves. Yeah, and you can also imagine the Sudanese people's perspective and Prime Minister Hamdok's perspective. You know, they've taken over this government uh, from Bashir and they're coming into power through a people's revolution, uh, seeing that as a major break with the past, Um, And then coming into it with an economy that's absolutely crippled. And then having one of the criteria of lifting these sanctions, being paying this massive compensation when their own economy has completely crumpled. So you can imagine why it wasn't maybe at the top of Hamdok's agenda when he came in. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I think there's a great deal of sympathy for the government. But, you know, as I've pointed out to many of my Sudanese friends, you know, there's no similar conversation going on around uh, around sort of debt relief. Right. So uh, nobody's saying that Sudan shouldn't pay its arrears to the international financial institutions. Um, And I think that you know, I've counseled them to sort of look at this debt uh, as an arrear. This government, this civilian government, has inherited the debts of the past, however those debts were incurred, and it needs to look at these legal judgments in much the same way it looks at, um, you know, financial debts that it that it has uh, taken out through financial institutions. It's, it's, it's on the hook for, for settling these in some way. The frustration that I think a lot of the regional countries, Sudanese, of course, and also a lot of U.S. allies have had is that people think the rejuvenating and stopping this free for all in the economy in Sudan will be so critical to keeping this political transition on on track and especially supporting the civilian side of it. And, you know, sanctions were designed to be absolutely crippling to an economy. That's how the U.S. designed these this specific designation as a state sponsor of terror. So can we talk a little bit about what these sanctions actually entail? And in Sudan's case, what effect did they have on the economy? The, the biggest effect is just the reputational impact of, of, of being in a club that includes North Korea, Syria, and Iran. And so uh, I think the biggest impact has been when you look at you know, certainly international banks, uh, when when there's a, a deal proposed uh, to work with any kind of Sudanese entity, uh, that goes to a compliance department inside uh, any bank, um, and that they and they would impose the same kind of impl- compliance measures that they would trying to do business with North Korea or, or Iran. And so, given the market size of Sudan, I think in 99.9 percent of cases, um, any sort of Western financial institution is going to look at that and say it's just too costly, and the business isn't significant enough for for us to try to go through the compliance uh, that would be required to do business there. So the reputational impact, um, I think, cannot be understated. Frankly, the, the, the sanctions, the comprehensive sanctions that uh, the United States had on Sudan beyond the state sponsor of terrorism, many of them were lifted in 2017 under the Obama administration as they were, as they were leaving. And so some of the, the most crippling aspects of U.S. sanctions were actually, were actually removed. And I think that's one of the things, I don't think we give enough uh, acknowledgement to the fact that I think that's one of the things that helped. Uh, spur of the revolution uh, was the fact that, uh, you know, for 20, 30 years, uh, the Bashir regime had been blaming U.S. sanctions for the downfall of the Sudanese economy. And when you took away some of that, uh, I think it peeled back the fact 
fact that this was, you know, a corrupt and kleptocratic regime uh, that was itself driving the economy into the ground, and it wasn't solely U.S. sanctions uh, that were having that that were having that impact. So, um, you know, I think. The sanctions have certainly had a, a huge impact. Um, there's no question about it in terms of preventing business from, from coming in. Um, but to say that it is exclusively the problem with, uh, with, with, uh, with the Sudanese economy, I think kind of overstates the power of them. Yeah, and these sanctions, of course, there is that reputational risk they give Sudan, but, but they also have real downstream consequences in terms of what you're able to actually do in the country. Um, wiring money from place to place... Uh, we've had crisis group staff, for instance, go to Sudan and, you know, we can't even get on email because somehow it has some effect on, on accessing our email inside the country. No question. No, I mean, it's, 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 it's hugely inconvenient, right? I mean, friends of mine, you know, can't update their iPhone apps. You know, you can't download uh, educational software. When I was in government, we, we spent a lot of time trying to get workarounds so that people could, you know, take the SAT online. And certainly it, it impacts the people, uh, you know, not in the regime. The regime people are, are, are largely fine, right? They leave the country, they up to, upload their software, um, you know, they have workarounds. Uh, through informal financial networks. Uh, but, you know, students and average Sudanese, I think, have really borne the brunt of, of the impact of many of these, of these sanctions. Um, and, you know, and that's, that just shows you sort of the blunt nature of the, um, you know, of the tool itself. Right. So I think there's one more thing to get through on the history of this before we dive back into the current situation, which is that one of the aspects of these sanctions is that because Sudan hasn't been a direct sponsor of terror for some time, the Sudanese keep complaining that Americans keep shifting the, the goalposts. That's the phrase that you often hear, shifting the goalposts. And as you mentioned, the U.S. was on some track to lift some of these sanctions under Bashir, which crisis group supported even back then. I'm just wondering, can you quickly walk us through the history of some of these shifting demands across multiple U.S. administrations on what it would take to lift the sanctions? Sure. Well, it's a, you know, it's a long and winding road, as they say. Um, the Sudanese have been arguing to be removed from the, at least the state sponsor of terrorism list, uh, basically going back to 2002, 2003, when they, when they really stepped up their cooperation um, with the United States post 9-11 on, on removing primarily at that time al-Qaeda subjects from, from the country. Salah Ghosh famously came to CIA headquarters at that time. And so, you know, at the same time, you had the, the Bashir regime cooperating with uh, the comprehensive peace talks uh, and the talks going on in, in Naivasha to conclude the, the civil war with, with the South. And so it looked like, uh, you know, from, from, a, from that stage, there was going to be a movement to, to remove these sanctions. And of course, the the crisis in Darfur emerged, um, and the Sudanese started backsliding on CPA implementation, and there was, of course, this global advocacy movement that, that sprang up uh, that really was calling for maximum pressure through the, the years of the Bush and in, into the Obama administration. Um, so that was sort of the first phase. I think the second phase was an acknowledgement uh, early on in the Obama administration that Sudan was actually uh, cooperating quite closely with us on, on counterterrorism and that, and that it would benefit the United States to step that up even further with um, technical assistance uh, and the like. And I think there was an effort at the time to delist Sudan then, really not on any other, not for any other reason other than the fact that the intelligence suggested that they were a strong counterterrorism partner and that for the sanctity of our state sponsor of terrorism list, it didn't, it didn't make sense to have them on there. It wasn't about, um, you know, doing, uh, acknowledging any kind of political gain or acknowledging uh, good efforts on the part of Sudan. It was really for the sort of sanctity of the uh, of the list, um, that effort, you know, hit hit a head wall within the within the administration, and so it never never really moved forward. At the same time, there was a kind of diplomatic track that the Obama administration was on, where we we came up with uh, what ended up being a very complicated uh, roadmap for um, relieving pressure and tension within the bilateral relationship that required. Um, 
literally dozens of small acts that, that we were asking of the Sudanese government. I mean, I think this gets to the, the challenge that we face in the, in the bilateral relationship at that time. You know, we were asking the humanitarian affairs uh, commissioner, for example, to release um, uh, blocked aid, you know, that was he- being held up in the port or to approve individual visas more quickly so that humanitarian aid workers could get into regions of Darfur uh, that they'd been expelled from. So we're asking for, you know, sort of micro level remedies to problems and they're asking for sanctions to be removed. And so there was a very um, imbalanced uh, set of demands. Um, and the fact was that that Sudan was only episodically uh, a uh, moving forward on these on these things, and you'll remember well the fact that you know you get you get a batch of visas approved, and then a batch of visas don't get approved, and and something gets gets cleared through the port of Sudan, and then something else doesn't get cleared through the port of Sudan. So, um, so I recognize the fact that it, it, it felt like we were often moving the goalposts from the Sudanese side, but it felt like from the from the American side that they were taking kind of one step forward and two steps back. Right, there was no overall commitment from the Bashir regime uh, to really do the things that were necessary uh, to, to get off of these lists. And so um, I'm sympathetic to the argument that uh, that it feels like the U.S. Has, has often been moving the goalposts. Uh, I think from the U.S. side, they would say um, that uh, that Sudan was all, you know, often uh, countering any forward progress with, with steps uh, backwards. So it seems like the main official obstacle now is the compensation for terrorist victims. And I think during Prime Minister Hamdok's visit to D.C., that came out during the the public statements. Do you think this is really the final hang-up, or are there unresolved debates within the administration about other things to ask for, about continuing to use the lifting of these sanctions as leverage to extract some more conditions from the new Sudanese government? Sure. Well, I think there's a group uh, within the U.S. government that looks at the state sponsor sanction as the the biggest piece of leverage that the United States has, and it, and it is. From a practical perspective, I think the U.S., uh, many in the U.S. government would feel more comfortable um, waiting as long as possible to have a better understanding of what the future political dispensation inside Sudan is going to be before they remove it. Um, and I've heard people um, you know, point to the lifting of sanctions in Burma and lifting of the state sponsor of terrorism designation in Libya as examples where within uh, months or years of lifting those sanctions, uh, you have essentially genocide being committed in inside of uh, Myanmar uh, and Libya descending into utter chaos. You know, people look at those two examples, and there aren't that many examples to uh, to look at, frankly. You know, for lifting of comprehensive U.S. sanctions and and terrorism designations, and so the few examples that we have have actually not turned out particularly well. And so um, again. It, 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 it puts Sudan in, in bad company in terms of uh, the precedent. Uh, you know, U.S. officials like to, like to work on precedent when they can, uh, and the precedent for lifting these kinds of sanctions is not good, frankly. This is where it gets a bit convoluted, because if it's U.S. policy to support Hamdok and the civilian side of this power-sharing government, and you have Hamdok himself tying his political fortune so closely to this uh, sanctions issue and coming and lobbying directly on it in D.C., saying this is what I really need from you guys, you Americans, to support me. And then the argument, like I said, is very convoluted, where you have people arguing that actually not lifting it might help him by keeping the pressure on the military side of the equation. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, one thing that I would have uh, counseled uh, the government there if I'd had the chance would have been... You know, the best way to have this removed is to work this issue privately and quietly. To play it out in the media, I think, is unhelpful. The lobbying, you know, I mean, part of their strategy early on was to get Gulf states, European states uh, to lobby the Trump administration. There's no there's no administration uh, that wants to be lobbied on its foreign policy by other countries. I think all of those things are kind of the... the um, the Sudanese sort of putting the cart before the horse um, and, and, and saying a lot of this before they had a lot established a lot of you know relations with, with the United States. Um, I think the visit to Washington was very positive uh, in December that, that the Humduk made um, in building confidence with U.S. officials. Um, 
you know, as much as as much as uh, I think official Washington wants to support uh, democracy and civilian rule inside of Sudan, they also want to have some confidence uh, in the decision that they're making. Would you say that part of the dynamic you have going on here is you have officials with real political heft in Washington at the moment who come very much from the America first Trump mindset. And then you have those who have invested more or have worked historically on Sudan and are interested in seeing its transition succeed. But those are the officials with less political weight inside this administration. I don't know that that is particularly unique to to this administration. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, this administration, I think one thing that I have uh, wondered about is, um, you know, this administration has been particularly tough on terrorism and has has really promoted, you know, the the, sort of removing ISIS from the battlefield and uh, stepping up its drone campaign in Somalia and things of that nature. So there's certainly a narrative uh, with the Trump administration that it is being extremely tough on terror. And I have kind of wondered aloud, you know, how does that square with removing a country from the from the terrorism list. Um, I do think that that's, you know, one aspect that uh, that will have to be thought through. Yeah, I'm <laughs> I'm struck, as as you mentioned a few times in this conversation, um, how you describe the internal dynamics within Washington in the U.S. And it seems like the current process is not one that's very speedy and that the sanctions might not be lifted in a very quick manner. But then we have the expectations on the other end, not only from the Sudanese, but interlocutors that we've engaged with internationally, and I'm sure you've engaged with as well. There's a huge expectation on the U.S. to lift these sanctions quite quickly. Um, And it's one of those situations where you constantly hear six to nine months from now, and except each month goes by and it's still six to nine months from now, it might be lifted. Are you worried about how this will affect Hamdok politically? if he doesn't get this designation as a state sponsor of terror lifted, given the fact not only uh, that it has a direct effect on on the economy, but also that he himself, you know, he's being judged partly on whether or not he is able to actually get this lifted. Are you worried about if the U.S. doesn't lift these sanctions, how this might affect his own political capital in the country? Absolutely, I think it's I think it's a real concern, and um, you know, listen, Hamdok, uh, you know, his great his great attribute is the fact that he is not a product of uh, the Sudanese political system, right? He was this consensus candidate who emerged, um, who had great and deep ties uh, to the West and international financial institutions, and was going to. Um, you know, sort of unsully uh, Sudan's um, reputation on the international stage, right? And so um, my fear is that if people look at him and say, well, you know, he was this guy that was supposed to get us debt relief and get us off these sanctions lists and, and get us right with the international community, and if he's not able to do that, then what, you know, what purpose is he serving? Because he's not really engaging in um, in the domestic political uh, debates going on, and so uh, so yeah, that's a real that's a real fear. And I think he's got to to do a better job of, of of managing those expectations. There's a lot that the Sudanese can be doing or attempting to do on their own to ameliorate the uh, the economic situation in the country, right? And and U.S. officials are quick to point out that a liter of gasoline in Sudan uh, is the cheapest in the world only after Venezuela, right? It's like nine cents a liter for for gasoline, um, you know, and you have 30 to 40 percent of, of the state budget going to support uh, subsidies that, that shouldn't be there, right? And so I think U.S. officials say, yes, uh, we need to do our part to, uh, to support this economy and this government and to lift our sanctions. But there's a heck of a lot that can be going on internally to Sudan to, uh, to ameliorate the, uh, the economic situation uh, in terms of uh, collecting taxes, in terms of having not so much of the state budget go towards the military and armed services, privatizing corporations held by the military and intelligence sectors, uh, and removing some of the, um, the subsidies that are in place, right? That's like 70% of the economy right there. Um, and then you've got everything that's lost to, to kind of corrupt activity. So U.S. officials look at all of those different leakages in the economy, and they say, how is it our responsibility alone 
to uh, to lift sanctions to, to to fix this economy when the Sudanese really haven't yet. I mean, we're we're you know you you got you know multiple PhD economists uh, in this government right now, and um, and none of those important steps really have been taken. They're on paper, uh, but they haven't been implemented yet. And I think that um, you know what what U.S. officials would like to see and what would give them confidence to move forward. I think with uh, with a more uh, a kind of aggressive lifting of sanctions is to see uh, the Sudanese themselves uh, making the hard decisions first um, to uh, to fix the economy with the tools that they have. So on a sort of closing note, there's this Friends of Sudan International Donors Group. What do you think the international community could do and should do more widely to support this transition? There's a certain amount of, uh, of of tough love that I think the international community needs to needs to bring. I mean, I think that there is again been this expectation that the international community was going to turn on, you know, uh, the spigots of international aid, and you know that's just not how you know sort of straight budgetary support is not um, is not really how Western governments engage. Uh, in the development sector anymore, right? Certainly there are things that we need to be doing politically to support civilian rule in the government to mitigate the um, the power of the military uh, and the intelligence sor- services um, and to promote, um, you know, long-term institution building in Sudan. Um, so there are, there are a lot of, I think, uh, things that we can be doing to put skin in the game uh, to show that we are investing in the long-term success of 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 the government, um, and I think that's that's critically important. And you might not see the payoff uh, in 2020, but um, it's a long term payoff. And again, this is a long term operation. We've got 30 years of of uh, pressure that we need to unwind, and it's not going to happen in six months. And does lifting the state sponsor of terror and the sanctions is this a precondition of large scale financial assistance from the international community? Well, certainly the the one requirement under the state sponsor of terrorism designation is that the United States vote no um, for um, Sudan at the international financial institutions, so African Development Bank, uh, World Bank, IMF. Um, so we are a no vote. We're not a veto, however. Western governments could move forward a funding proposal at any of those institutions that, again, the United States would be required to vote no on, um, but it wouldn't mean it wouldn't go through. And I think the question there is why why haven't the, the Brits or the French or the Germans or other uh, board members of those institutions, um, you know, moved uh, – you know, moved big funding proposals forward. Now, of course, they are in arrears uh, to these to these institutions. So, I think again, it's it's a slow process. Um, you know, the international community is not set up um, uh, very well to inject um, cash and um, other needed uh, tools to keep a government uh, like this one. Uh, afloat for even short periods, which is why I think the Gulf states have played such a critical role because they, uh, you know, they don't have those uh, encumbrances, There's, or at least the same encumbrances that that the Western governments have in terms of budgetary support. So, um, you know, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting mix of friends that that Sudan has to court right now, and I think that uh, over the long term they're going to want and they're going to need uh, the kind of technical support and assistance that U.S. and other Western governments can can provide, but in the short term, they're going to really continue to rely on the largesse of uh, of Gulf states uh, who have their own political agenda, quite frankly, inside Sudan. And then and the Hamdok government is really going to have to balance those uh, those competing interests. Thanks so much for coming on this podcast. Well, thank you, Alan. It's great to talk to you. Thanks for listening. You can find out more about Crisis Group and read our reports at crisisgroup.org or follow us on Twitter at Crisis Group. Once again, I'm Alan Boswell. This episode was produced by Mae Francis.